I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker now, uh, Trey Ford, who actually begged me not to read this uh, bio. Um, he said it was painful to hear, but I'm going to read it anyways. So, All right, so Trey Ford is a security executive, industry strategist, and research advocate. You need to add thought leader, brother. <laughs> Evangelist, is that on there? Oh, he's hating this. I'm getting some dirty looks now. Oh, geez. So over the last 15 years, Trey actually ran Black Hat events worldwide as general manager, provided services ranging from global security, strategy, incident response, product management, PCI QSA. Woo! You might want to cut that one off the list. Uh, and security engineering for a variety of industry-leading companies. He spent time at Rapid7, Zynga, McAfee, Fishnet Security, White House Security. In all seriousness, uh, I've known Trey for a while. He's got a very unique perspective. He's, he's a guy that promotes others. All his experience at Black Hat and all other places, I think he's got a lot to say. I think he had too much to say, so I'll be very curious to see where you're going with the keynote. We're uh, really privileged to have you here. So if, if you help me, welcome Trey to the, the stage. Thanks. <laughs> Wow, a lot of you guys showed up. Can you guys hear me okay? Are we good? Yeah. All right, let me do some computer things here. Good morning. Um, my name is Trey Ford. Um, I'm super excited to join you guys this morning. I'm really glad that you guys got up after what I think for a lot of us was a pretty late night last night. This has been an amazing conference, very excited. You guys are in your fifth year, 400 people. This is huge. Um, I wanna tip my hat to the RVA SEC team, the volunteers, special thanks to Hope and the crew here. Uh, putting on an event is a labor of love. It's a mountain of work. And uh, when you see the volunteers, the folks in the green shirts, let them know how much you appreciate their hard work. As Jake indicated, I apparently can't hold down a job. Um, I've spent about the last 90 days uh, outside the workforce. I left Rapid7 just a little while ago, and uh, I love the team, I love the work, but um, it was time to move on. We, uh, we had solved what I came on to do, and uh, rather than look for something I shouldn't be doing, we opted for me to step out and take a break. And if you get an opportunity to do this in your career, I'm gonna encourage you to do it. So what I've done over the last 90 days is run in circles doing a lot of other things. Uh, this keynote and this conversation I hope to have with you this morning is a time to reflect back on a little bit, not just from my career, but things I've been focusing on while studying between these two gigs and preparing for my next role. Uh, hopefully there will be something here all of you can walk away with and I'll try not to geek out too much on aviation stuff. Is that fair? Is that right? So, um, flight lessons. You know how to spot a CrossFitter or a vegan or a PhD or a pilot, right? It just comes up, they always bring it up. I'm gonna be that guy this morning. So, when you guys fly, anybody with a fear of flight, and there's nothing wrong with that. Wendy, I love you for that. So, flying is, for me, something I live for. It's in my blood, and um, this is probably the wrong time to go into the story about why I got into flight, but very simply, it's my dad's first love. I learned to fly to get to know my old man better. He used to be an authoritarian, he was my dad. He told me how to do things. Learning to fly changed that. And at some point, you want that relationship between parents and children to be, go, be going somewhere from, you don't tell me what to do, to you're my peer, you're my confidant, you're my friend. We share things. And doing that has been amazing for me. So I got into flight. Uh, learn to fly, and I actually thank Jeremiah Grossman for pushing me out of the nest and to start flying, but that's, again, a longer story for another time. A lot of folks want to know, are you wanting to transition into full-time aviation? And the answer, of course, is yes, but I'm good at math, you see. Um, it cost about $250,000 US to get through all the flight training to get from basic visual flight, instrument, commercial, to get your air transport, the twin engines and the jets, $250,000 to get all the experience just to clear the baseline minimum for insurance standards to start flying for an airline. 
and your reward for that down payment, my friends, is 22 grand a year. <laughs> Poignant moment to pause, reflecting on the senator's remarks yesterday morning. I too am from Texas. I was on the same flight out from Austin with Wendy. Um, but I'm gonna tell you, you don't need a degree to do security. What you do need is humility. What you do need is curiosity. What you do need is a dash of initiative, but what you need a whole lot of is critical thinking. So we're gonna tear parts of this apart, but I wanna maintain focus on priorities, margin and fatigue through this. So this is the kind of flying I do today. They call this VFR, visual flight regulations. Visual meaning you have to see, maintain visual separation from other planes. Have any of you ever dr driven your car in a dense fog or into smoke? You now they say like, if you drive into smoke, pull over, turn on your hazards and wait, right? Because, you know, smoke just disappears quickly. <laughs> in aviation, you have to have a special endorsement to fly into conditions where you can't see clearly. So that looks more like this. You have a dashboard and you're socked in. So you're literally flying in the clouds. They call it in the soup. This is what they call IFR, instrument flight regulations. It's instruments, you're flying on the instruments. And there are so many parallels. The more I dig into this, the more parallels I find between aviation and information security. They say to trust your instruments. One of the things we'll talk about is looking at these instruments and realizing sometimes you're getting a false indication. You've got to cross correlate across everything you're looking at and you learn nothing is what it seems. You learn, and we talked about this yesterday, Ben gave a great presentation on metrics, and getting an understanding of what good metrics are and what good indicators are, but asking what is this telling me and what am I missing, we're gonna unroll this further. So this is the approach light sequence. You, when you're flying in, this is what every pilot dreams of seeing. You break out of the clouds, you can't see, you've been flying literally with just your dashboard and this radio going crazy. And if you break out, you've done it right, you see the approach lights, you found your way home. This, this is safety, this is freedom. This means you get to walk away. So many sayings in aviation. We're gonna focus on a few of them, but let me compare the differences here. You know the difference between a good landing and a bad landing? You walk away from the plane, that's right. A great landing is one where you get to reuse the airplane. If you have some trepidation, I'm very sorry, it's gonna get worse. So when you're flying, right, there's critical speeds, there's stall speeds, there's maneuvering speeds, there's all kinds of information you're processing. They say that speed is life and altitude is insurance. You know the difference between kinetic and potential energy. Speed is life. If we maintain enough speed, enough air across the wings, we maintain lift, the plane keeps flying. We all worry, what happens if the engine goes out? You know the difference between a plane with an engine running and a plane without an engine running? One's an airplane, the other's a glider. <laughs> speed is life. If you don't maintain critical speeds, you stall. Stall means you're not creating lift. Stall means you're no longer an airplane. You're on your way to becoming a lawn dart. That's bad too. Process this and understand, pilots are kind of brave people. Maybe kind of stupid. Crazy, yes. I'm going to tell you that flight instructors are crazier than we are. As a student pilot, full time, what I'm doing is trying to kill my instructor. Think about it for a minute. If I screw something up and the instructor's not on top of his game, what happens? We're lawn darts, that's right. It's a very simple equation. So when I think about risk management, I think a lot about what we do as security professionals. We're actually not the pilots. Most of us don't run our companies. We do inform, we do coach, we do try to protect, we try to avoid this lawn dart scenario, but at the end of the day, we're strapped in and we're along for the ride, and frankly, the FAA is gonna blame anything I do as a student on the instructor. Whatever happens, we're gonna be left holding the bag, so we've gotta be thinking this through. Any of you teaching people, children to drive? Some of you? Oh my goodness. Is that scary? And we're talking like you're on the ground, you hit the brakes and you're, you're sitting still. Like there's no lawn dart consideration, you just get honked at and flustered. We're talking a whole different level of confusion. 
So when you start thinking about this, we have to break down how we're going to teach and impart all these principles that one, isn't just teaching a student to learn to fly a plane. We want to become pilots. I challenge you that the instructors are actually doing a greater thing. They're teaching us not just to fly and pass a test, but to survive and fly afterwards as successful pilots. They're creating students for life. They're empowering and fostering this curiosity. And we've got to continue this training. We've got to continue this education. Things will start to slip. So we're going to break these things down into a couple of areas. So when we talk about, please tell me this is still functional. We're going to talk about priorities first. Everything in aviation is prioritization. And something that I've learned, and it's really funny because I've had to dog food myself. Any of you between jobs right now? You all are employed. Right on. <laughs> they say there's 0% unemployment in this industry. Has someone seen a hand in here? So, as, since I'm the only one unemployed in this room, let me tell you what it's like being unemployed. <laughs> You're busier than you are when you have a full-time job because everybody that talks to you might be wanting to offer you a job. So you're looking your best. You're following up with everybody. You're doing your research. Oh my goodness, you're busy. And the funny thing about that is, there's the stuff that you wanted to do, and let me tell you, my wife has a very thorough and proper and carefully prioritized list of things to do on that honeydew list before I start back to work. Oh dear, I've accomplished nothing. That's next week, really. Um, so the most important thing that you do in an airplane, you guys have heard this, the most important thing you do in an airplane is the next two things. Anybody know what this picture is? How many of you can drive a manual, a stick, a trans, yeah. You know how to do this on a hill, right? Forget the driving test and forget parallel parking. If you can drive a stick on a hill at a stoplight, you win. You remember the first time you did this learning to drive. Oh my goodness. Okay, so I'm gonna do what? And you're gonna, it's only like three things. An e-brake, brake, four, okay, there's more going on. And you have to layer these things up. And the most important thing that you're talking this student driver through is the next two things. You're gonna start to engage the clutch, you're holding it with the e-brake, you're gonna let off the e-brake and accelerate and try not to stall the engine. Pretty simple, but holy cow, if these things don't add up. You remember those situations. It was a long night, you know, you're in high school, you're driving home from your buddies, uh, you're coming around the corner, it's a little dark, it's a little wet. You, of course, you're speeding, because that's what we do. It's a tight corner and you realize there's an accident around the corner and you realize you've gotten behind the car. You were messing with the radio or fussing with your phone, and now you've got to do one of two things. Hit the car, slam on the brakes, or go into the ditch or the other lane. We've all been there. The most important thing you do in aviation is about the next two things. You cannot get behind the airplane. There's this funny phenomenon. When you start flying, you go from being a normal human, you know, you're, I'm talking to my wife and everything's great, we're talking about what we're gonna do and how excited we are. 7164 uniform, uh, two miles out. What is that? We cut into this captain mode because we're talking on the radio. We have this, set. you've heard pilots talk? This is your captain speaking, level at three. They go into this tone. And there's something magical about this, and this is something that's coached and taught. What we have in our minds when we're flying, and you today, you tomorrow, as leaders in this industry, you're looking into the future, you're looking over the horizon. You've got stuff you've got to do today, you've got deadlines, you've got projects, you've got compliance stuff, but you've got to keep in mind what the next two things are. Where you're going, how to get there, not just how to get through today. And this is part of how we lose track of priority. The most important thing in aviation is the next two things. Everything I'm doing in a plane causes me to ask one more question. What am I not doing? So my dad is an amazing pilot. I grew up every, like, through my childhood, every Friday night, my mom would work the graveyard at the hospital. And so me and my brother would go downstairs and we would sleep on the floor in the front room. That's where dad would put us down because we would watch Top Gun every Friday night. <laughs> no way, my dad was a hell of a pilot. My dad was great. And I grew up on this. And so learning to fly, I would talk to my dad about the lessons I just took. I tried to hide it from him. I wanted to surprise him with it. 
And what I learned was, you know, it's like that Monday morning quarterback, you evaluate your performance. He went through and talked through every flight and every lesson, and he's showing me things I didn't think of. And in preparation for my check ride, I'm, I've passed my written test for the IFR, I'm getting ready to do my check ride. Everything I'm doing right now is asking the question, what am I not doing? What am I forgetting? When I'm level, flying along, what am I supposed to be doing? There's more to this. You should never be sitting still in a cockpit. In the event of an emergency, as a pilot, you have three principal duties. Aviate, navigate, communicate. In that order. If you stop aviating, what do you become? A lawn dart. Oh, man. Use this when you see people nervous at the airport. They're going to freak all the way out. In aviation, we train for every eventuality. Engine outage, aborted takeoffs because we had an issue. We test for everything. We practice for everything. And let me tell you, they wreck us testing all this stuff. And it's great. In the event of an emergency, we have three principal priorities. If you're not flying the plane, you have nothing else to do because you're a lawn dart. Navigate. When you're flying in the clouds, you have to maintain those critical speeds. You've got to maintain an idea of where you are on this map, navigation, and you've got to communicate. You ask for help, you tell them where you are, what you need. And this is interesting, this carries right over to how we communicate to management, how we talk to partner teams, how we talk to leadership. Those of you that are executives, you're going to answer three very similar questions when you go talk to your partner teams. Every executive you ever meet with has three questions they need answered the moment you get their attention. When you book time with an exec, you don't show up, hey, hi, what's up? <laughs> no. What do I need to know? Why do I care? And what do you need from me? I don't call up air traffic control, someone's 6'4 uniform, hey, what are you guys doing for lunch today? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> There's a protocol. This is very serious. And they only talk to me on a workload permitting basis. They're taking care of the airlines and all this other stuff. And the magic of this is, and this comes back to who you are at your core and in your identity. Your priority, your mission, is what determines everything else you do. And it reframes all of the other priorities you work with. I can't get on the radio until I know where I am. I'm just a, remember radio shows you to call in, hello caller. Hey man, this is Trey, long time listener, first time caller. I'm over here in Liberty, Missouri. Hey man, how you doing? When you call into air traffic control, I have to tell you where I am in 3D space. So I'm 64 uniform, I'm three miles northwest of Taylor Airport, 3,500, climbing 5,000 request. And then I make my request. They need to know where I am. They're gonna give me a little code to type in so I can use my transponder to identify myself. Greatest words I'll ever hear, radar contact. They see me on the radar, they know who I am, they see me and they're gonna to try to keep me from turning into lawn dart or meeting other airplanes in a very unfriendly way very quickly. Very exciting. When you go talk to other groups, you have to have a mission, not just a, we're working on this project. Man, there's a rant I would love to have right now. Um, any of you guys following the, uh, the big, I guess it's a Twitter storm right now, talking about bug bounties versus penetration testing and how that's a dangerous proposal? Bug bounties are just as good as penetration testing. No, it's not. From an academic standpoint, I think it's worth arguing. From a legislative standpoint, I think it's important to discuss. But in terms of priority, I'm looking for defects. I'm looking for the identification of issues and a way to communicate it. My big picture is this. If there's an unlikely romance where somewhere in the world someone's gonna say, I saw this, it looks out of place, you wanna know about this? That's a healthy conversation. How we're going to foster specific teams to hack and tear apart stuff to teach us about insecurities and vulnerabilities in our technology and stack, worthwhile. But keep your eye on the big picture. The most important thing happening is the next two things. Know where you are, where you're going before you start the communication. So navigation, pilotage, and dead reckoning. Now, you guys are all security people, so you know that hackers make airplanes fly sideways, right? <laughs> a few of you live on Twitter. The rest of you that aren't laughing, get on Twitter. <laughs> Very important, like, this isn't a joke. It's like PR Newswire 
customized and tuned with everything you need to know from the industry. You select the people you want to follow, and you'll be current on everything. Tim Wilson back here from Dark Reading. He's a great editor. His team writes amazing content. But before his team can write and blog about this stuff, we hear about it on Twitter. It's a great thing for all of us. This is how you get closer to fast information. So airplanes fly sideways. When I talk to air traffic control, when they talk to me and give me a heading, they're trying to give me a magnetic heading. But when I plan, I'm not using a magnetic heading. I'm using true computation. When I get the winds, it's a true heading on the winds, not magnetic. You know where the North Pole is, right? Santa's workshop and all that? No, they buried it underground in Canada. That magnetic North Pole wrecks everything. Like, magnetic declination is a total mess. The funny thing about when we're flying and we're planning and we're communicating what's happening, you have to fly slightly sideways all the time. You know where you want to go, but sometimes you've got to do this other work to get there. You're flying sideways because the wind's coming from over here. That throws off all of your fuel calculations. The energy that keeps the engine going keeps you alive. There's a lot more going on all the time. You're recalculating, recalibrating, and making sure your priorities are where they need to be. You may not be able to make your destination airport because you took too long getting off the ground or winds changed. There's this other thing that happens, and I think this happens to all of us, and this happened not just in my flight training. This happened most of the time that I had free time between jobs. So I've been off for about three months, and my principal focus was helping some friends and getting my IFR flight endorsement. There's a problem with that statement. I can't have two principal focuses. You're going to get distracted. You're going to get pulled away. The flight examiner has a specific trick they like to pull. They're going to get you started asking about something. Now there's parameters. I have to stay within 50 feet of an altitude that's assigned by air traffic control. That way they know where I am. And I'm not going to meet other pilots in a very improper way. So I'm flying on this heading. And they're going to notice that I've started to climb. And I miss that because I'm checking my instruments and I'm doing this other stuff. Uh, you know what? I want you to take the ILS, not the VOR approach. OK, I'm going to start looking up the other plates. I'm dialing in to get the weather and the radio and the winds on the airfield. And I'm still climbing. And I'm not paying attention to how far I'm drifting off of where I'm supposed to be and what my mission, my long-term goal is supposed to be. And we get distracted. And so the instructor's like, hey, so I saw that you chose to input this into the GPS this way. Can you talk me through that? Well, sure. So what I wanted to and not only have I busted my altitude, which is points against me on this test that I'm now most likely going to fail, I'm still climbing. And by the time I figure out I've busted my 50 feet, I'm 1,500 feet out of bounds. <laughs> That's like paperwork. <laughs> this is a problem. The most important thing you're doing as a leader, as a pilot, is the next two things. You have to be aware of what you're doing, what's distracting you, where you're going. Aviate, navigate, communicate. You are doing what it takes to get the job done. Some of us, our jobs are full-time interruption. Navigate, be very clear about what your mission is. Does anyone have a hard time juggling strategic goals versus tactical distractions in email and meetings and all this other stuff? Do any of you spend times, you've had those days, 8 a.m. meetings where you were back to back all the way till 5 p.m. Those are the same days you generally have emergency meetings that keep you busy till 7.30 because nothing else got done. You know those days. What have you accomplished in that time? I don't know how I spend seven hours a day on the phone being unemployed. I don't get it. But now that you're all employed, I think I understand why. Everyone wants to hire. So priorities. The next two things, aviate, navigate, communicate. Have I hammered those into the wall yet? We good? So margin. How many of you are in management? All right. How many of you have special pet projects, things you're learning, your home lab, little VMware box, you're doing your OWASP uh, hacking and these sorts of things on the side. You've got special projects or open source things you're contributing to. Good stuff. I think it's great stuff. Keep that up. The lifestyle we want to live and the versions ourselves, of ourselves that we wish to be has everything to do with honoring those priorities and protecting our margins. The rest of the world tries to work a 40-hour work week. I think security folks probably work more like 100 hours because we're clearly smart.
Now, I'm my best when I'm flying. It reminds me about so many things, keeps me grounded. Of course, I'm passionate about it. And I'm here to tell you I did something dumb. I, uh, <laughs> this Tuesday, I've got two missions back to back. I'm gonna be flying a plane for about seven hours with a break in the middle, IFR, test prep, getting ready for my check ride. I don't know if I'm actually physically capable of six to seven hours of focused IFR under the hood, test level, wow, I'm real sorry, test level focus. You see, we have regulations about the fuel reserves in an airplane. A plane that's not flying is a lawn dart, so we're real serious about not letting that happen. So fuel, when you fly a plane in visual conditions, the goal is to be able to fly during the day to that airport, and if you have any issues, you've got 30 minutes of extra fuel. You know, if there's an accident on the runway, or um, you know, like there's cattle grazing, <laughs> you gotta get them off the runway. You've got 30 minutes to figure that out and put the plane down. Nighttime, they make it 45. For instrument flight, because we're socked in, remember, you can't see out the windshield. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have to fly, have enough fuel to fly to the airport, make an attempt and realize, oh, maybe the minimums in the clouds and the fog are too low and too dense and I can't land here safely. I have to have enough fuel to fly to my alternate airport and then for an additional 30 minutes in case I have to hold or make a couple of attempts to get down. And that's a lot of reserve, that's a lot of extra. And when I'm talking through this from a logistical standpoint with my flight instructor, I realized every day, now mind you, I'm talking seven days a week, unemployed, I've got six to seven hours of scheduled activities every day. How many of you guys do that at work every day? You schedule that much content every day. What does your inbox look like? What do you get done? So as I come back into the workforce, one of the things I'm thinking about is how to manage that margin, how to give myself room to breathe. As a manager, how often are we real short and real curt with people because we're too busy for them? We're too busy to be present. How many of us sit with our loved ones and focus on our phones and toy with Twitter? Now, this may be a generational thing, but the one thing I want to try to carry with me, and I'm gonna fail, so please keep me honest, and this is gonna be on the internet, so I'll never live it down. <laughs> Busy's not a virtue. It's nothing to brag about. How are you doing? I'm busy. <laughs> God bless you, that's wonderful. I hope that goes well. I don't wanna do that. We wanna work hard, we wanna honor our commitments to our employers, our friends, our families, but I'm going to challenge you to try to carve in more margin. I'm gonna challenge you to try to create space in your calendar. I'm gonna challenge you to be present where you are and laser focused when you can. So priorities, margin, and fatigue. So I'm gonna to try to lump margin and fatigue together um, for a couple of very important reasons. I was uh, chatting with Wendy this morning a little bit about the direction of the talk, and uh, it's funny, when we're technical professionals, how many of you guys have moved from technical into management? A bunch of you. How much different is management? You spend your whole career trying to grow a brain and get your technical chops up, and you transition to management, Holy cow, like there's a lot about business communication and business writing, but man, managing people, investing in people, like I'm gonna be hiring a coach to help raise my game. And one of the things I keep hearing from folks that are working with executive coaches, and Wendy and I were talking about it this morning, is margin. This is something we have to do for ourselves and inspire in other people. If we don't do that, we face fatigue. Even best, in our best form, well rested, we're gonna face fatigue. Those of you doing the Twitter thing, this is the photo you want. I'm gonna get out of the way and hide behind the lectern. This is the photo you want. If you do not manage your calendar, someone will. Any of you guys working in the SOC today? A few of you, God bless you guys. Thank you for your hard work, we love you. Being unemployed, there's absolutely no reason. I have no boss, I have a wife, and that's probably good enough. And how do I have so many phone calls? How do I have so many meetings? It doesn't make any kind of sense to me. Something I learned back when I was running Black Hat, and we did this a little bit when I was running the IR team at Zynga. Uh, when people were on something that was time sensitive, two things happened. 
One, that person would go dark and focus on it, and I'm talking cell phone off, go off IM, we all, all know what they're doing. We know how to find them if we really, really need them, but we would let them go focus their laser and burn through what they had to do, and we'd all block and tackle, and when they came back up, we'd sync up, reprioritize, and continue working. If you don't block stuff onto your calendar, not just margin, but time to focus, someone's gonna do it for you, and you're gonna accomplish a whole lot of nothing. Decision fatigue. So this is a real thing. The medical world knows all about it. You know who's more, who actually knows more about this from a street smart perspective? Prisoners. Convicts. You know convicts on the day of parole hearings line up two hours, or at least as quickly as they let them out of the house, to go line up. But they want to be in the first couple hours of the parole board hearings. The reason is, not just because people are favorable in the morning, they ate their Wheaties, it's because the focus and the ability to think critically has a limited time span. Uh, you guys familiar with like Pomodoro timer, like those little focus uh, onion apps and that kind of stuff? Or uh, Pomodoro, not onion, uh, tomato, tomato timer. The idea is that you can probably focus full laser focus for about 15 minutes. What you're seeing right here is uh, the likelihood of an ideal position uh, coming out of a judge. This is an Israeli judge. And what they found over a period of time is that if you can catch the judge right after a recent feeding, when they let him back out of the feeding troughs, after lunch, after morning tea, afternoon tea, you're probably going to get a favor favorable disposition from the judge. I think it follows logic. Now, we've, well, we all see curves like this. Um, the idea is the more decisions you have to make, every email you touch and respond to is at least one decision, one commitment you've made. Every decision you make, as the number of decisions goes up, the quality of those decisions goes down. Make sense? I think we all do this. God bless whoever made these badges. The RVA SEC badges this year, those are amazing, right? I couldn't imagine doing that many of them. There's a lot of manual work that went into that. It's phenomenal. Every time you touch something, make a decision, over time your focus goes away. Anyone disagree with this? This is critical. This is so important. So when we talk about owning our priorities, when we talk about carving out margin, part of margin is your rest. I don't want to brag about a 60-hour work week. There are countries that are actually moving to a six-hour work day. Can you imagine what that would look like, a six-hour work day? How many of you work on your open source projects or your extra stuff after hours? I'm talking 10, 11, 12, midnight, one, two. You ever checked in some code and the next day looked at it and figured out, I had no idea what I was doing and no business talking to humans, let alone writing code. <laughs> Tell me more about the Internet of Things and how you made that ship date. Holy shnikes, this is bad. Oh my goodness. So the legal field knows about this. The medical field has documented decision fatigue more than anybody. And salespeople, all right, we're in tech. Those of you in sales, I'm sorry, I respect what you do. It's a lot of hard work. And we don't generally trust you because you're generally far more influential and savvy and talk us out of things that we didn't like that. There's no way you should have been able to do that. But we need to learn something from you. All right, salespeople, how many of you protect your call hours above everything else? You know the windows of time we're most likely not only to answer the phone but talk to you. And those hours, guys, they protect those hours above everything else. Their whole life revolves around being at peak energy, being current on the news and ready to offer you value, read up on your account. So in that moment when they connect, they're giving you their best. We give salespeople a really bad time, but I'll be dogged if we shouldn't at least honor and respect what they're doing and try to do it ourselves. When's the last time you spent that much energy preparing for something? Probably when you presented or talked to management or the board or proposed a raise. <laughs> they do this every day. I think it's a great thing. This is something I want to try to build into my next chapter. The other part of decision fatigue isn't just about laser execution and getting things done. It's a little bit about minimizing errors. How are we doing on time? Oh man, we got plenty of time. You guys want to nerd out with me on, on plain stuff for a minute? All right, so FAA test question. Government test, we're actually gonna talk about a government test question. So figure 149, instrument interpretation system malfunction. Uh, before we get started, any of you guys pilots? Oh, wow. All right, guys, you got to get into this. It's great. 
So we call this the six pack. On a college campus, a little weird calling something that doesn't have bubbles a six pack. This is the six pack. This is the most important thing in my whole planet right now after my wife. Up here in the center is what we call the artificial horizon. The attitude indicator tells you when you have a bad attitude. It's magic. And does anyone hazard a guess what this is telling us? Like the ground looks like it's kind of sideways. We're turning to the left, right? Left, right? Why are we turning to the right? The wing is down. Good. We're turning to the right. Don't fly with me. <laughs> On around the clock. So everything in your scan starts here with the attitude indicator. Generally speaking, you're literally going to wagon wheel back and forth from that as your center and spoke out. To the right, that's the altimeter that reads like a clock. It winds up. I guess clockwise, and so that reads about 4,000 feet right now. That's good. No indication of change because this is a very, very paper-driven test. Down to the right, vertical speed indicator. As it goes up, it's telling you, because there's a little aneroid barometer, it's telling you how fast air is coming in and out of that barometer. No vertical speed indicated. Down below, compass card. Turning to the right. All right, smart guy, which way are we turning? So it's turning to the right, so it tells us the plane's turning to the left. Tell me more about the laws of physics. Attitude indicator, wings down to the right, and we're turning left. This is going to feel funny. Real hard to do that straight and level, or at least not getting altitude. Turn coordinator on the bottom left. I'm going to move over here so you guys can see this. So the turn coordinator in the bottom right, it's a turn and slip indicator. What this does is we know that if we put our wingtip on that lower marker, we're gonna, do, we're gonna do a full 360 degree turn in two minutes. That's three degrees per second. So when I'm having issues with my instruments, they can tell me, uh, six four uniform, come right uh, 15 degrees. I put my wing on that line, I count to five, I level out, and I'm about 15 degrees to the right, okay? That little ball in the center down there at the bottom is a slip indicator. So uh, think when you're driving on the ice. When your tail's going to the outside, you're skidding. When you're on the inside, you got understeer, you're slipping. This tells you on that Z axis which way the plane's turning. There's a lot going on here. Top left is our airspeed indicator. This is lawn dart prevention. This is the most important thing happening right now. Uh, so we're doing a little under, I guess that's 200 knots. Pretty fast, we're in a nice airplane, 200 knots. I don't own anything that flies that fast. That's great. So what we have here in the system, or the, the test is telling us, we have a system malfunction. So right now, everything looks in place with these center two instruments being slightly confused. What this tells us is we have a vacuum system failure. And what we're doing is we're cross-correlating the instruments to say, look, if I'm turning, if I'm turning to the right, the compass should be taking me in that direction. That compass, which is usually slave to my magnetic compass, this one here is powered by a vacuum. So it's pulling air through the system and spinning a little gyro that powers these instruments. I've had a failure of this system. During the check ride, one of the hardest things I will have to do is land a plane. They put these little visors on us so we can't see out the windows. They're going to take black suction cups and slap them over these two center instruments. And I have to shoot a landing with four of my six pack for guidance. This is super fun. I'm clearly not a smart human. This is like accelerated Darwin. It's not good. <laughs> and we do this on purpose, and I'm paying a lot of money to do this. I'm going to try to do this for six hours on Tuesday. Guys, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be used. Have any of you taken the CISSP? You, you walked out of there, and you felt great, right? You felt used. Decision fatigue is real, guys. Even at our best, even standing on stage looking at something I should know how to read, I'm going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. The idea is to capture those mistakes quickly. In aviation, we love mistakes because when there's a mistake, that means we found it. And that makes things better. All right, so this is the part where I embarrass myself. Um, I'm giving you something to try to pin a thought to. And I'm going to call it Icarus Hours. Any James Bond fans? So this was what? Die Another Day? You guys remember this one, right? Pierce Brosnan. 
um, what was this guy's name? Gustav Graves. He had that cool Nintendo glove. And he had this satellite with all these diamonds. It would harness the power of the sun, and it would fire a laser. <laughs> it was the perfect bond. What I loved about it was this. And we talked about this, and I used this um, label earlier, but I talked about focusing your laser on something and working on something. How many of you, when you're working on a project, go dark? You shut off IM, you shut off Slack, you shut off Skype, you shut off Twitter, you shut off Facebook, you kill browsers, you kill email, the corporate instant messaging thing, and put your phone in airplane mode. And I know I've missed stuff. How many of you guys do this routinely? I know one of you does, a couple of you do. My challenge to you is why don't we all do this? Now, I'm not advocating that you go dark for a long time without talking to nobody. Managers don't like that. But when you're working with a team, being able to maintain that priority focus and saying, listen, you know what? I want to be responsive, and I know that's professional, but I need a couple of hours to rip, rip, just rip this thing out. You know, on average, like, how many of you guys work with sales engineers or have a project or working with a vendor to try to deploy something and test something? Several of you. One of the things you will learn as you work with vendors and move into the corporate world is it takes about six to eight months in a corporation to do about 20 minutes worth of work. I'm gonna say that again in case the rest of you didn't catch that. It's gonna take six to eight months for a corporation full of people getting paid an embarrassing first world salary to do about 20 to 30 minutes worth of work. I don't know if they're holding prayer committees that are gonna to put together agendas so the, uh, the Hope Project can talk about this and then they're gonna Care Bears stare their way. I don't know what's happening. And I know change management's a thing and that's a great best practice. <laughs> but getting things done is hard. <laughs> and I think it's generally a lack of focus. I think it's a lack of priority. I think it's a lack of discerning what needs done now and what needs to wait. If you get the opportunity to work in a startup company, you're gonna learn something very neat. <laughs> it's painful, and those of you that have been there will know what I'm talking about. There comes a point where you as an executive are eating ramen noodles so you can make the payroll, and your company's in war mode. Um, ben Horowitz just released a book recently called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Wonderful read. It's a book of his bad beats. I'm gonna encourage you to check it out and read it. It's, it's a phenomenal read, it's a page turner. I read two thirds of it Wednesday. <laughs> um, one of the things he talks about is when you're in a war scenario, and if any of you work in IR or in the SOC or are incident commanders, you're gonna know exactly what this is about. When something happens, it's all hands on deck. When something happens, there is no other priority. When something happens, the whole company in this moment works with you. When you're stuck, when you're trying to get something done, you'll have someone that owns the progress and you'll have teams dedicated to getting any blocker out of the way. At Black Hat, we had a lot of curveballs thrown at us. The, the RBA SEC team has gonna have dealt with curveballs that they've already forgotten that have happened this week. And in those moments, priorities become clear there's no reason that we should need an emergency to crystallize this for us. My challenge to you is this. Rule number one, if it takes less than 40 seconds to do something, don't take an action item, do it right now. That applies to your personal life and to work. I need to send an email, I need to go create this account, whatever it is, knock it out. Number two, when you start your day, crystallize. Here are the things I have to do, my projects, my priorities. I guarantee you the salespeople know exactly what the number is they have to make, how they're gonna plan their day, and the hours they need to make those calls to make that move forward. We, we talk smack on folks like that, but I'm telling you what, they're a little more mature in this area than we are, certainly. Protect your Icarus hours. Find a window of time that you can block on your calendar that you go dark. You talk to the team, hey guys, I'm gonna drop offline for this window of time. I'm not taking a long lunch, it's not an okay Cupid date, I'm gonna be working and I'll be back at this time and I'll check back in. And try it out, find half an hour or an hour. When you've got a project that matters, block it. Those of you that are in college, you know how to cram for finals. Why can't we apply this today? 
So in parting, this is the summary slide. This is uh, a little review and a book of my bad beats and things I'm hoping to take into my next gig. The most important thing you're working on is the next two things. Be clear about where you're going. Be clear about how to get there. Be clear about things that are in the way. Don't get behind on a project. Don't get behind on the most important things you're investing in. Aviate, navigate, communicate. I think we all kind of have an idea of what our priorities are, but I think a lot of us, I don't know, flow like a jellyfish, we just kind of go with the flow. Let's crystallize what we're working on. That also allows us to manage our margin. Carve out the time to knock the stuff out. Carve out the time to rest and recover. One of the greatest things you can do is rest. The majority of aviation fatalities happen because of a lack of rest. There's a short list of things, but they all start with a lack of rest, which led to a lack of attention. Protect those margins. And then finally, decision fatigue. Be aware of the decisions you're making. Separate things out and try to carve out time to turn on your laser. I'm a little ahead of time, so I've got time for questions if you've got any. I didn't want to take your questions anyway. <laughs> Guys, have a great day too. Thanks for having me.